Well, I'm sure many of you were following the action from Cheltenham's opening fixture of the new season last weekend. You'll be well aware, if you were, that it was a particularly good couple of days for the visitors. We had the likes of the usual suspects, Charles Burns with a winner, Willie Mullins with his only runner scoring, Gordon Elliott with a couple as well. But leading the way with three winners from just eight runners was this man, John McConnell. John, welcome. Thank you. Another trip across the Irish Sea for you. You're probably... Well, used to it at this stage, water off a duck's back, I guess. But how good a weekend was that for you last weekend? How much satisfaction did you take away? Uh, we took a lot of satisfaction because we'd thought about coming for the last two or three months. It was a lot of my horses wouldn't be winter horses, so it was for some of them it was, might be their their last run for a while. And uh, things worked out. Most of them ran really well. Um, the three that won in particular, there was different reasons why they were satisfying for me, but. Um, yeah, I was. I would have been happy with three. I, I wouldn't have been happier happy without three, but I, I was delighted to get three. You know? Is that kind of a sign of how far you've come that you're going to Cheltenham and probably would be a little bit disappointed almost if you didn't have at least a couple of winners? Well, I, I suppose it is. Um, we really felt we had good chances with some of the horses coming over, and um, yeah, I would have been very disappointed if, if some of the horses hadn't hadn't won. In particular, I really thought Fenner Cross had a great chance from the day he was. Uh, placed in Galway in his first maiden hurdle, I thought he had a super chance. And the horse that won the bumper in Canter Bruno is a, has been a very good horse at home, and and uh, we just wanted him to go and prove it that he could do it on the track again. So it was great. Yeah, he looks to have a really bright future. John, I think you'd be the first to admit you haven't been an overnight success. You've been training for quite a long time now. When did you first take out the license? Was it around about the turn of the century? Well, yeah, I I, I qualified in uh, veterinary in two thousand and I got a restricted license in two thousand and one, when I was like twenty, twenty three, twenty four. So, but that was for one horse. Um, when we tipped along there. I, I worked as a vet for seven or eight years, and <clears throat> eventually decided to have a right go at it in about two thousand and eight. Um, moved to the Curra. Thankfully, the recession started just as I moved, so that that put us under a lot of pressure. And um, moved to where I am then, 2010. And listen, it has been slow, but it's getting going now. Mm. Where did the desire to train come from? What kind of lit the flame for you, so to speak? Um, we we always had horses at home on a very small scale. We had a couple of brood mares or whatever, um, and I did a lot of eventing and show jumping when I was young. But I suppose really, Michael O'Brien trained very close to me at home and I would have ridden out summers for him and really enjoyed that and felt I had a good kind of grasp of of the horses and I was always a very well I would say a very uh, good kind of form guy um, I liked the, I liked the odd flutter back in the day not so much now but back in the day I did so <laughs> um, I and I was always going to be as you can see too heavy to be a jockey so I it, it was always in my mind to to try it at some stage um, my parents were pretty adamant to go and get a degree, so uh, I did the veterinary degree, And um, but it was always kind of going that direction. Mm. Just how difficult were those early years? I mean, you mentioned the recession there. You're going into a highly competitive profession. You often hear it said Ireland is as competitive as it gets when it comes to racing. Was it pretty tough going at times? Oh, for sure. I mean, when we started properly with, with the recession coming in, uh, it was, you know, it was nearly, you know, we're nearly to the we were nearly gone I suppose um, but uh, you have to have the belief in yourself I suppose and, and the, the dream if you're not a dreamer in this game you're, you're probably in the wrong game so that always fueled us um, I remember the trainer Tim Pitt uh, a long, long time ago said that it's the most confident stepping game you could be in and he, I think he trained a group one winner um, and you know <clears throat> I'm still looking at horses in the parade ring and turning to somebody going are they fit um, you know so it's it's a tough game, but, you know, I wouldn't change it. Mm. It's interesting what you say there. Have you kind of in many ways learned as you've gone along over the years? Pretty much. Like, I, I didn't, I wasn't pupil assistant anywhere. Um, um, I would have read a lot of books in college uh, on how to get horses fit and stuff like that. But a lot of it was self-taught. And um, the system we have now is probably in place maybe five or six years maybe that's something to do with the turnaround and fortune but um would you change that now if you could would you spend time with other yards if you had your time uh, again possibly yeah um there was a lot of things happened around uh, 2000 um killian was born just pr pretty much just out of college so that changed everything for me so um you know uh it wasn't the case i could just up and, and leave to go to Newmarket or wherever to to be an assistant so um uh you know, listen it, it was the path we went down and uh I was quite happy 
tipping along with a couple of horses early on and um, hoping to get the, the breaks and I suppose then getting good owners into the yard that would spend some more money was a big factor. Mm. Looking back on it now, I mean, do you feel there was a turning point at some stage? Was there one victory or maybe one horse who perhaps convinced you that you could do the job and this was the right path to follow? Um, I mean, we, we, we had a quite a, a good bit of success early on. We had a horse called Sophist who we bought out of German Azita for 7,000 and he won the grade three juvenile hurdle in December um, on, I think, his second run over hurdles. And he was all ready to go to the Fred Winter and then got a leg. So that was very early on. But, you know, to find a new one for 7,000 like that would be as hard as you know. So I always believed that I could do it. Um, but there's one thing in this game especially, there's a lot of people believe they can do it and there's a lot of people that can do it but don't succeed because they don't have the look or they don't have the backing or, uh, you know, things like that. So you have to, everything has to go your way um, to be successful in this game, in training anyway. And your operation is obviously a year-round one. You're yeah. becoming increasingly influential with the jumpers but have a lot of flat horses to run as well. Plenty of them run throughout the winter at Dundalk. Is that... Difficult to juggle, or are you quite happy to, I suppose, keep both fronts active for as long as you can? Well, I love both codes. Mm. Um, I find it very hard to compare uh, when a two-year-old works very well or when a horse schools very well. They both give you the same feeling. But, um, I mean, it's it's been born out of not being able to turn down people because we weren't in a position to or anything, you know, so... I took kind of what I got, and it's been a mixed bunch all all along. Um, my jump horses would probably be of higher quality because that's where the money's been spent by the owners in that area. But I love flat racing as well. Obviously, I had a case of you before uh, Ado took him over, and um, you know, it's uh, I would love to be able to do both. Um, Henry does a very good job. Obviously, Willie does a very good job um, with with you know mixed horses. So. Um, I would like to be able to continue both uh, both aspects of it. Do you think it's more difficult to compete in one or the other? I mean, the, I suppose the pendulum swung perhaps more towards jumps now is the more difficult yeah, game, really, I, I to would, get in amongst the big guys. I would it? agree with you that the jumps are so competitive from the point of view that um, even if the Kumar guys go to buy yearlings, they're still unraced, un, un, untried horses, whereas the horses that have been bought now by the the big guys are in the jumps game are all proven either in France or in point to point. So they have a head start. They're probably all in Ireland anyway. They're probably all running about three school and hurdles before they go to a maiden hurdle. So you, there's no easy races anymore in Ireland, you know. Um, <clears throat> and on the flats, sometimes even the good horses can take a run. They're not a lot of them aren't, you know, drilled first amount, especially from the good yard. So if you did have a good two year old and you did have them ready, you, you could win your maiden um, but it's you know it's very very competitive over, over there as you know mm. I'm not sure if you had a long term plan set out when you started training or, or maybe it was a case of just finding your way but if so are you roughly where you envisage you might be at this stage <laughs> of your career or were you aiming even higher no about 10 years behind I'd say All but right. um, um, that was probably romantic uh, notions I had um, I mean I'm very happy where I am now we've got a great team great team of staff great team of owners, and I want to keep pushing. I've said a lot to people that when I was struggling, I felt I was hungry, but I'm 10 times hungrier now that we're actually doing okay, you know? So um, it's become more an obsession than it ever was now. Mm. Dave, you've been listening to John's backstory there, I suppose, and you'll be familiar with his raids to Britain over the last couple of years, which have obviously borne an awful lot of fruit, not just at Cheltenham last weekend. Is he becoming a... Man, increasingly, that British punters are sitting up and taking notice uh, of you. Of feel? course, I mean, I think there are a couple of really interesting things, John. First of all, is that you are breaking into, you know, whether you call it a duopoly or a triopoly or whatever it is. You know, I mean, like I, I know people who who came away from owning horses in Ireland because they just felt that they couldn't really get a look in. Yeah, and so you've managed to do that, which is. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm sure you're not going to uh, sort of uh, uh, boast about it, but it's but that's a that's some something to achieve, isn't it? Mm. it? Must be quite a daunting thing at the start. It is. It, um, it is a daunting thing. Um, it's funny because I 
thankfully now I have a horse for the McNeil family and I was talking to Max McNeil last week at Cheltenham and he just he was introducing me to somebody and he described me as a disruptor um, which I kind of I, I kind of loved um, uh, you know so I suppose that's kind of what you're saying um, kind of trying to snap at the heels of the big guys but it's you know the, the big guys are obviously very good trainers but they're also backed by a lot of a lot of money and um, we have some big owners now putting in a lot of money but um, we kind of need to keep bolstering the team all the time to really um, you know keep put them under pressure to what extent do you think the the sort of blank canvas aspect of your training life to what extent do you think that is a career you you've obviously come from veterinary from a veterinary background and you've obviously got an inquiring mind that's able to think that worked that didn't work to, to what extent is a is a a non-traditional uh, upbringing background can that be an advantage would you say I think it can be both an advantage and a disadvantage it's definitely I've always seen myself a little bit of an outsider you know uh, with no r real racing connections at all so um, from the political and social aspect of getting horses I've maybe been held back a little bit then I also don't as Gary knows I don't conform to maybe the tailoring of some <laughs> of some sh other trainers I, I uh, um, it's almost like a trademark, though, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, it is, and I kind of it's a bit goes with the disruptor. I kind of enjoy um, turning up in a in a, a woolly hoodie at the dog sometimes. Um, but um, there's no doubt that I've been bringing the veterinary to it, um, and maybe it's maybe a little bit more scientific um, aspects of it has a, has been a help and. Um, I think people, when they come in and, and ride out, especially, um, they they know the difference in the way we do things to a lot of other yards, you know. Because I mean, you know, the the most famous example of that, I suppose, in the UK is Martin Pipe, you yeah. know, who just his his father was a bookmaker. There was no received yeah. wisdom from a father who trained. You know, he just had this bloke who wanted to absorb every bit of information. Exactly. I've just actually finished reading his autobiography um, literally two weeks ago. Um, and he, you know, he was obviously a legend and something that I would aspire to, to, to be like him. Um, I mean, I'm getting some recognition now. We've got a good few English owners on board and obviously we travel to the UK a lot. So it's, it's great to be able to broaden the, the whole ownership base. And, but, he, you know, I never... I don't get too excited, even though I was delighted about Jam, I don't get too excited about things. I, I, I'm always, my feet are firmly on the ground at, at all stages, you know. And the fact that you're getting owners like Mac, Max McNeil and he's far from alone, you, is it Derek Kieran's who has a lot of horses with you, yeah. Canto Bruno being one of those happy to spend good money on horses, is that a sign of, I suppose, not just how far you've come, but your own confidence in your abilities that you're able to get these people on board? Yeah, I work hard at trying to get people... Um, I'm quite a harasser when I need to be. Um, Derek is obviously a major factor in the yard, and you know he really, he's he's really game for it. You know, if I come to him and say you need to get this horse, he will try to get it. You know, um, so it's you know a lot of trainers don't have that um, that backing. So you know I, I can't be you know any more thankful for that and. But I need twenty of of them, <laughs> you know. Um, you can't rely on one man either. And um, getting the McNeils was a, was a big deal. And hopefully we can keep getting some of the big guys. You know. How did the association with Max come about? Was it through having runners over here? Yeah, I met him in Musselburgh, and um, I think Barnstein Lad bet one of his horses there. Um, and yeah, I basically started to harass him, <laughs> and. Um, um, I think he maybe likes the fact that I was he, the disruptor um, quote. So um, we got in touch with Ian, the, the manager, and uh, we've, we're, we're good buddies now. And um, we got a horse during the summer, so it hasn't run for us yet, but he's a nice bumper horse. Mm, one to look forward to. And one of your winners last weekend, I think there's a bit of a connection there as well. Seddon is the horse in question. He runs for a syndicate now, the Galaxy Race. Yeah. Syndicate, but Previously with the McNeils, what was the, yeah, what was the story there? Um, well, the Galaxy, you, you, you know the Galaxy lads, they've, they're a bit big enthusiasts, um, but they never had had a jumps horse before. They felt they couldn't get in at a level. They're kind of a small, um, money-wise, they wouldn't spend 50 or 100,000 on horses. So 
they, they always felt they couldn't compete if they went in at, at, at a small level. So from talking to Ian, he told me Seddon was going to be sold. He, um, he's getting on a little bit in years. But for us, we were able to buy a horse that was at enough of a rating that we could at least go to Cheltenham in October no, and November and compete in nice races. Well, we didn't really know at the time whether he was going to be competitive or not, but uh, it turned out that he, he is, and it was, it was fantastic. Yeah, what was that day like for them? Because, as you say, a relatively small syndicate, punching above their weight, a winner at Cheltenham, I think might yeah. well have been the first time a few of them had been in the parade in there, probably. Yeah, there was a lot of tears um, for them. You know, some of the guys that have been looking at Cheltenham and going to Cheltenham for an awful long time and never believed it was possible to stand there. And I know it's only the October meeting, but it's still different. Um, there's, and I, I was trying to nail this home to all the owners. We brought a lot of different owners over for, for last week, and I was trying to nail home to the, all of them how different it is. Even though it's a small meeting in Cheltenham in October, it's different to most meetings. It's special. And I think they all got it, and um, it was brilliant for the guys. They, they're still bathing in it. Speak to me about some of the horses you've got got you to where you are today, John. I suppose you mentioned him already, but a case of you who moved on to Ada McGuinness after you trained him to win a Group 3 would be one of the more high-profile ones. Did you see his potential for what he's gone on to achieve when you had the horse? Yeah, we did. We, we, we always felt he was good. I'd never had a Group 3 horse on the flat, or sort of subsequent Group 1 horse, but he was different from the very start. And we, when we really like a horse, we'll take him to the curb to work on grass. And I remember Shane Foley riding him one day with our workhorse, who had never been beaten. And uh, he beat him by about four lengths. And, and then subsequently Shane couldn't pull him up at the top of the gallop, uh, which he didn't like. But um, there's a video somewhere of Siobhan Rullish doing a cartwheel across the, the gallops in the curb after that because we were so excited by it, you know. Then I somehow managed to get him beaten first time out in Bellies Town. Um, and when we dropped back in trip is when he really saw the best of him. So... It was, a, it was an unbelievable story. We paid very little money for him. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to sell him, but financially it made sense to sell. Um, I probably wouldn't sell the next one if I get the next one. Do you think you would be able to hold on to a horse like him now? Would you be able to get someone on board to perhaps... Well, if, I had, if it was mine and I had to hold it myself, I would mm. at this stage. Um, but if, if, I mean, there's probably more of a chance. We did try and get, you know, some of the big flat guys involved, but I suppose... His sire, Hot Streak, people just turned their nose up at him straight away. You know, even despite what he'd done on the, the track, they, they didn't want to know him. So, um, you know, Ado stepped up and has done brilliantly with him, and um, hopefully uh, he, can, he can get him back on, on form again. I'm sure you take a bit of pride in what he's gone on to do. Has it been bittersweet, though, in some ways? I, I listen, when, I, when we were loading the horse up for Ado, I said, it's killing me, he's going 10, 10 kilometres down, 10 miles down the road. But... Um, I'm delighted he went on to win those Group 1s. Uh, uh, I, I could do without people asking me was I sick about it every, every two minutes for the, for the next week. This would week. be the last time. I yeah, but, you know, um, I wasn't really sick. I was delighted for the horse. We'd, w- what I had got out of the horse w- was life-changing. So it was, um, you know, we were thrilled to see him do well. Anna Benin has obviously been an absolute star for years, won a stack of races flat and over a jump Scottish champion hurdle amongst her whole. Just how key has she been to the progression, development of the yard? Yeah, she's been important. Um, I think people know how small she is and uh, how tough she is and she wins a lot of races um, and uh, you know, the champion hurdle was a brilliant day. Um, I'm calling myself a champion hurdle winning trainer now. <laughs> uh, that's, that's what I'm leaving it at. And then um, you know, Killian, my my son, rode rode her to win in Killarney, which is a big big trail on the flat. Um, so she, you know, she's just. I mean, any stable will be delighted to have her. Um, so she's a big factor. She's on a break now, but um, she's been a big 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 deal to us. You mentioned your son Killian there. He's kind of come on the scene as an apprentice in the last couple of years. He's doing very well too. Has that kind of added an extra dimension to the whole operation for you? I know you can't be seen to favour mm. your own flesh and blood, but in fairness to him, he's proved capable when he's got his chance. Yeah, no, he can do it when he gets the the, the, the chances, I suppose. Maybe I give him even less opportunities than I would if he wasn't related to me because I can't be seen to to push um, him forward. But he, he does very well. He's obviously in college as well. So, 
Uh, he's going to get his degree anyway, and we'll see how things go. But he can write, um, and he really enjoys it. So, I mean, you know, it's been very... Obviously, I couldn't do it because I, I was uh, too fond of my croissants, but um, he, he's <laughs> light. Plenty, plenty I see you, that, yeah. yeah. He's light, but, and, he, you know, he can do it. So I'm, I'm very proud of him. Rightly so. Tell us who are the horses that are really exciting you in terms of the future. We're always looking forward in this game. Who are the horses that you think can potentially take you to that next level? Well, the horse that won the bumper in, in Cheltenham and Canter Bruno, he was very impressive. And one of the reasons we put Tom Scudamore on him is because he would know uh, how good he could be. And he was very, very impressed with him. Uh, he kind of likened him to Moonracer, who won the same, same race um, for him a few years ago. Uh, he's very, he's been flawless at home, so he's one to look forward to. We have another four year old bumper winner called Kinbara, who won first Mountain Killarney first. Um, uh, he's, he looks to be very nice as well. Obviously, Bardenstown lad was very good last year over Novice Hurdles. I probably shouldn't have run him in a stall. The ground was too quick, but he's back going very well um, at home, and hopefully he, he can make an, a dent in the Novice Chaser ranks. And we're probably going to run a horse called Not Now Ned in the bumper in Chatham in November. He won in uh, Valleystown first, and he looks to be a very nice horse as well. So we've got, And we've got others as well. Um, Another mayor that's going to go to Cheltenham for the Phillies bumper that won in Galway, not keeping you going, she's called. So we've a lot of young stock, and hopefully some of them can turn out to be really good. Lovely. Cheltenham, obviously, firmly in John's thoughts for some of those horses. You do have a runner at a slightly lower level at Wexford today. Just give us a word on that one. Happy wife, happy life. Happy wife, happy life, yeah. Um, she's a big girl. Uh, I'm sure she's only coming to herself now. God knows what the ground is going to be like in Wexford, but if she handles the ground, she should run well. Um, she was competitive last year in Maiden Hurdles, so she should, should run a big race. Lovely. John, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks very much Thanks indeed for, for me. clocking up even more air miles joining us <laughs> here today. Good luck with that horse today and for the season and years ahead. Cheers. Thanks very much. John McConnell, then, the trainer whose career is only going in one direction.